Well, it's, uh, it's a real joy for me to uh, have some of my old members from Milton here this morning. I've warned them that they must laugh at all my jokes <laughs> in the right places. Uh, it's, it is really good to, to have them here. Dear, dear friends, Ray and Ruth and uh, Steve and Ray, uh, and bless you. Bless you for coming and for being willing to pay six pounds to cross the bridge. Uh, it's money well spent, uh, and uh, one day it will be done away with, and you'll be able to freely come into God's own country whenever you want to. But bless you. Um, I, I was thinking during the week as I was preparing for this morning, there's a lot of talk in this day and age about Greatness. We've just had the Olympic Games and the Paralympic Games. I'm sure you watched it. And uh, we were amazed, weren't we, as we watched the television screens, the feats of some of these athletes, the things that they were able to do. It's absolutely fantastic. And then last night I watched Strictly Come Dancing. <laughs> the things that people can do. One minute, Lewis is on a pommel horse, and now he's dancing, strutting his stuff uh, on the dance floor, the ballroom dance floor. But I got to thinking, we talk an awful lot about great people, but what makes you great? What makes a person great? I guess it all depends on who you ask. You know, an athlete might say that it's about peak physical conditioning. They've got to be at the top of their game. Uh, unlike many of the Liverpool players at the moment, Steve, that just doesn't happen, I know, but... Uh, Never mind. Somebody in business might uh, say that it's all about connections, it's all about networks, it's all about who you know, being able to clinch a deal or having financial clout or, or leverage because you know the right people. You go to Hollywood, they might tell you, no, no, the secret to success is the body beautiful. It's obviously not I've been over there and uh, not really, man, but... You know, but people have different ideas about what makes you great. What is it that defines a great person? And you come to a, a, a scripture passage like this one that Beth read for us a moment ago from 1 Samuel 16. And you come to that verse. I, I'm sure it's a verse you've come across before. It may be a verse that some of you who are parents have used in trying to encourage your children uh, when they were young and they were maybe, you know, getting a little bit taunted by other kids and maybe they were pointing out, you know, that oh, they wear glasses, four eyes, you know. My, my son used to get called that all the time. And, you know, maybe they're a bit chubby and, and, and they called them, I don't, my nickname when I was growing up was Bubble. That gives you a clue, doesn't it? <laughs> Never mind. Um, and, and these things, you know, people say these things, and, and, and very often I remember people saying to me, oh, God looks not on the outside, but on the inside. Yeah? I didn't realize that was actually in the Bible. But here it is, it's in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. It's a verse there that's used actually regarding David. And Jesse had uh, all these sons... And uh, Samuel had come to anoint uh, the king, and he met the different sons. Jesse trotted them all out one by one. They were handsome, debonair, and tall, and athletic, and no, 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 no. And then they get to the final boy, and actually that's the one who the Lord's hand is on. And he's anointed. And we're told that this is because the Lord does not look at the things that man looks at. Verse 7, man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Now, if you're an underliner in your Bible, that's a good word to underline, heart. God looks at the heart. The heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. And that's what we're going to explore together a little bit this morning, because God is saying that greatness is determined more by what's going on inside here than all the other stuff that we may have, the trappings of life, the success that we might enjoy, or whatever. It's about character, not really about your reputation. Character 
as you read through Scripture, is the bottom line. So if you want to make your life count, if you want to be great, it's a matter of the heart. So this morning we're going to look at David, one of the greatest men who ever lived, and then tonight we're going to revisit him and explore his life a bit further so that we can get a real picture of what it means to follow God when the reality, as it says on the notice sheet, is that our lives are a mess and we muck up and we tend to think that we're just not going to be able to follow God. David was a, an intriguing guy. He was a king. He was a, a poet. He was a shepherd. He was a general. He wrote some of the most beautiful passages in the Bible. The, the book of Psalms is it's just a fantastic book. He united kingdoms. He was a giant killer. We know him very well for that incident with Goliath. He had an incredible lineup of achievements. But the truth is, God wasn't looking at that stuff when he was dealing with David. What impressed God about David was what was going on in here, his heart. In Acts chapter 13, David, God said, is a man after my own heart. So I want to ask you a question this morning. Are you a person after God's heart? Do you want to be? Because God says that David had a heart for God. How do you get that? I mean, how do you know a person's heart? By looking, I believe, at the way they respond to some things that life throws at us. And in David's life in particular, we can look at four things that help us understand how he had a heart after God. And those four areas are this. The stuff that we do wrong, what the Bible calls sin. How do you respond to that? That will show what your heart's like. The second thing is stress. (laughs) Stress. We can all, yeah, can you relate to that? How do you cope with stress? Because that will often reveal what your heart's like. So you've got sin, you've got stress. Service. How do you respond to to service and the opportunity for service. And the final one, of course, success. How do you respond to success? That will often reveal where your heart is and what's going on in your life. So this morning we're going to compare how David handled these things and how you and I handle those things. And then we'll take that on a little bit tonight. So do come back this evening and we'll, we'll take this study a bit further uh, in regard to David. So let's, let's look at sin, first of all. David's response to sin, the stuff that he did wrong. I mean, he mucked up big time. He, he wasn't, you know, the, the lovely shepherd boy sitting in the corner that's painted in a lot of these children's Bibles, and we just think, oh, David, lovely. Oh. He's not the David that I learned about in Sunday school that, frankly, I dismissed as, you know, this holy Joe that I could never be like, this great man of God. Do you feel like that sometimes with some of these Bible people? Do you read your Bible sometimes and think, I can never, ever be like that? Goodness sake, are these people real? Where's, where's the problems in their lives? Well, you start to look at David. You start to think, look at the way that he dealt with the stuff that goes wrong, the sin in his life. And the number one thing that you see that he did was that he had a repentant heart. He had a tender, sensitive conscience. When David blew it, and boy did he blow it, he admitted it. He didn't hide it, he didn't deny it, he didn't make excuses for it, he didn't rationalize it, he admitted it. We live in a world where people are encouraged to have a vanishing conscience. Not my fault. It's the way I was brought up. Yeah? I'm not saying those things don't have a bearing on us, but sometimes you need to put your hand up and say, I got it wrong. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have acted in that way. It was wrong of me to think those things. And David was quick to do that. Again and again we see that in his life as you follow it through. Particularly in the book of Psalms. In Psalm 51, he he writes this. Have mercy on me, O God. 
He's not saying that, you know, have mercy on me, O God. He's, have mercy on me, O God. Have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion. He says, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. That's a guy I can identify with. Because I know my sin. That's the problem, isn't it? Do you find that? We're all too well aware of the stuff that we do wrong, think wrong, say wrong. It's there. It's in front of us. And we can kid some people some of the time, and they think that we're we're lovely people. The truth is, we know the truth about ourselves. And it's there. And he's crying out to God, and he says, God, have mercy on me. This is his prayer of confession after he just committed adultery. Everything's in the Bible. He just committed adultery with Bathsheba. That wasn't the end of the story. He then committed murder. Because he sent uh, her husband, Uriah, to the front of the battle to make sure that he'd be killed. And he cries out to God. He realizes he shouldn't have done this. And he cries out to God in repentance. Have mercy on me. Wash away my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. My transgressions are ever before me. There's his cards on the table. He says, look, I blew it, God. I blew it. It was wrong. So he doesn't deny it. He doesn't excuse it. He doesn't blame Bathsheba. Well, there she was on the top of the roof. I mean, what was I meant to do? I'm a man. He admits... I shouldn't have done this. He's honest with God. And that's a characteristic of a good heart. That's a guy who says, "Mm, I'm not right here. I love the Bible. I love it. It tells the truth. You'll never find a book that has more murder and rape and incest and problems in it. The Bible. It's all in there because the Bible loves to tell the truth about the human condition. So that's why I can come to the Bible and go, actually, I can identify with a lot of this. When it talks about man, it talks about his good points and his bad points. When you have a picture taken of you, uh, the other week after the induction on the Sunday, photographer from the Argus was here. You can tell how bad the pictures were. Not one of them was published. Praise God. (laughs) I hate having my picture taken, as some of you are getting. I do. I hate it. But sometimes people will take a picture of you, and you're unaware. Yeah? And you look at that picture, and you think, oh, gosh, I didn't get my good side. Because they end up taking a picture of you, warts and all. And you think, oh, I I wish I'd known that you were going to take that. But see, the Bible paints pictures, warts and all. So David, we need to understand, warts and all. Says he was a king, yes he was. Says he was a poet, yes he was. Says he was a great leader, yes he was. But it also says he was a liar, he was a betrayer, he was an adulterer, and he was a murderer. The truth. You don't have to be perfect to have a heart after God. Isn't that good news? Isn't that good news this morning? Seriously. You don't have to be perfect. You glad to hear that? Amen. Me, I I tell you. One of my heroes, Alexander McLaren, great 19th century preacher, stood in front of 3,000 people. And he said to the people, he said, if you could look into my heart, you'd spit in my face. Don't think I'm perfect. I'm a sinner. I do stuff wrong. I get things wrong. But I cry out to God. Because you don't have to be perfect in this game. Many people are called a man of God or a woman of God in the Bible. But only one person is described as a man after my own heart. And that's David. He was a great sinner. But he was also a great repenter. You don't have to be perfect to have a heart after God. You just need to be a great repenter. 
Psalm 51, he says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. He believed in a forgiving God. He focused on this God who would forgive him his failures. No wonder God would look at him and say, Do you know what? This guy is a guy after my own heart. I think the problem with many Christians today is that they've been conned into thinking, because of my past, because of the things I've done, because my life isn't perfect, God can't accept me. There may be somebody sat here this morning for whom that's exactly the way they process stuff. You may be a younger person thinking, (laughs) if you only knew half Mark about my life, hey, he knows. He knows. And on the authority of what we're looking at here, you're acceptable. You may be an older person, and your life has not gone the way you thought it would have. There have been lots of cul-de-sacs on this road of life, lots of detours. Things haven't worked out as you thought they would. Hey, I want to tell you, he welcomes you. He welcomes you. David put these things before the God, the stuff that had gone wrong. And he acknowledged that God would welcome him. How do you compare with David on that score? How do you react when you sin? Do you excuse it? Do you rationalize it? Do you deny it? Do you blame other people? Or is it time to say, actually, I need to keep short accounts with God and I need to repent of these things? And maybe before you leave this service this morning, that's what will happen. Because you'll realize this God actually welcomes you. When it comes to stress, that's another area of David's life that we can learn a lot from. What he demonstrated was a trusting heart. Few people, I think, experienced more stress than than David. I mean, our lives are incredibly stressful, aren't they? You look at any calendar or diary of most people sat here. There's stress in our lives. Those of us who are still working, there'll be deadlines to meet. There'll be uh, things that we have to make sure are finished. There'll be deals to close. There'll be uh, expectations of us. Uh, So at the end of the month, when we collect our paycheck, people will say, yeah, okay, you're doing the job. That's fine. It's stressful. Let's not kid ourselves. But here's a guy who knew stress. Here's a guy who who went through uh, fighting giants, running from Saul, hiding in caves for years, constant war with neighboring nations. He had one son rape his daughter and another son kill that brother. He had another son rebel against him and overtake the throne and took his place uh, uh, and was then killed. He had tragedy and he had stress. This guy knew what stress was. And if he said this in Psalm 118, in my anguish, in my stress, I cried out to the Lord, for he answered me. The Lord is with me, I will not be afraid. Courage is not the absence of fear. I wonder if that's a word for somebody here this morning. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is being able to move on in spite of it. David had lots of stress. My flesh and my heart may fail, he writes. But then he goes on, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. See, everybody else was afraid to take on big old Goliath. Remember the story? There's Goliath, 19 feet above criticism. Everybody else running for the hills, which as happens when I come into church on a Sunday. <laughs> and there's this little shepherd boy. You know the story, don't you? Everybody else was, oh my gosh, he's too big. He's too intimidating. David was like, he's too big to miss. Come on. And he wanted the fight. You read the story. David ran to fight Goliath. Ran. Woo-hoo. That's a whole other sermon. Everybody else was petrified. See, everybody has dark days. 
Every single one of us in this room, let's be honest, we have days, don't you wake up sometimes in the morning and go, oh gosh, am I the only one that happens to I? You, you wake up. Some of us suffer from depression. That's a reality. Let's be honest about it. Some of us are very down. David, interestingly enough, wrote some of his most powerful things when he was gripped by depression. Many commentators think that he was actually bipolar, that he suffered from manic depression. And if you read the book of Psalms, you'll see things like this. I believed, therefore I said, I am greatly afflicted. Perhaps some of us here this morning need to do that. We're going through times of darkness right now. And I just want to encourage you, keep on believing. God's with you. God's with you in the midst of whatever you're going through. And your heart, just put it out there to him. Just be honest with him about it. When I was in school, I took up photography. And there was a school club, photography club. And uh, it was great fun because I got to be in a dark room with lots of girls. Okay. Sorry, Trevor, but it's true. And uh, photography is an amazing thing. I don't know if you've ever done this kind of photo processing stuff, but they use these acids to develop pictures. And uh, we'd go out and we'd take pictures and we'd try to be arty. And I used to go down to the mumbles and take pictures of, of mumbles as the sun was going down. And, oh, it was, it was very arty. It really was. <laughs> but we had to take the film back then to the, to the, to the school and we'd put the, the negatives through this uh, acid. And, and it, every, the acid it, it is strong, so it, it helps develop the pictures. And if the acid isn't strong enough, the picture doesn't come out clearly. And I was thinking about that. A lot of us in our lives are like photographs. When we're going through dark times, you know, for the Christian, at least in my own life I've seen this, when I'm going through those dark times, it's like that acid. And some of you here this morning, you might be going through very dark times. Things may be very difficult for you. It's eating you up. But you know what? I believe God's developing you. He's bringing something beautiful out of this. He is working. Keep on believing. Keep on trusting. Keep on going with him. I could say that the problem with some Christians is that they're like some of the photographs I used to end up with, which were overexposed and underdeveloped. But again, that's a different sermon. Character. What's going on in here this morning? That's the secret of greatness. When you sin, you have a repentant heart. When you're under stress, you have a trusting heart. Thirdly, David's response to service was a servant's heart. The great thing about David is he was willing to do whatever God wanted him to do. His desire was always, I just want to do God's will. I may muck up, I may get things wrong, but I want to do what God wants. And interestingly enough, in Acts 13, where it says of David that he was a man after God's own heart, it goes on to say, he will do everything I want him to do. I'll put my hand up. I don't do everything God wants me to do. Well, you're not throwing stones, so some of you are in the same boat then, are you? (laughs) We don't do everything. But what a thing to say of a guy. He'll do everything I want him to do. Could God say that about us ever? Is that our default? Do we actually want to do everything God wants us to do? See, this guy had a servant's heart. The characteristics of a servant heart, you know, he was wholehearted. Psalm 119, I will seek you with all my heart. You can imagine him, can't you? Full of zeal, full of enthusiasm. He was a Welshman, definitely. You know, he, 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 it was a joy, not a duty. It's a joy for him to seek after God. He wanted to serve the Lord. So different from us today. So often we are lukewarm, let's be honest. We get somebody else to do it. Let somebody else serve. Let somebody else do that ministry in the church. I heard a kid the other day saying in response to a request from his mother, 
shouting at her. And he said, what are you looking at me for? I'm not your servant. And I thought, gosh, that's so indicative of the age in which we live. Servant to nobody. And even in the church, sadly, we've forgotten how important service is. Service to God, service to one another, service for and on behalf of of each other. I don't want to embarrass anybody, but you know one of the joys I have is to come down here early on a Sunday morning, and there are people serving, getting things ready so that you and I can enjoy the worship, getting teas and coffees sorted out so that we can have refreshments after the service, getting the Sunday school classes ready so the kids can go out and meet with Jesus. It's quietly behind the scenes. Some of us need to step up to the plate. Some of us need to understand there are areas of service for us as well. Things that aren't necessarily up front. Things that are behind the scenes. This guy was focused. He refused to be sidetracked by less important things. In Psalm 119, he says, "'Turn my eyes away from worthless things.'" I often think maybe that would be a good verse to put on top of our television. (laughs) Strictly come dancing is fine. You're all right. (laughs) X Factor, well. But some of the rubbish that we watch on TV, maybe we need to write it on the cover of some of the magazines we've got. It's not just me, is it? Have you noticed how easy it is to get distracted in life today? So that God and faith becomes much lower a priority. For many people, trivial pursuit isn't a game, it's a lifestyle. That's the reality. Because they're into all sorts of trivia. They've got to have this, they've got to have that, and then they move on to something else. David was focused. Absolutely focused in his life. He wanted to serve God because that was what was going to count. He said, I want to make my life count, so keep me from paying attention to what is worthless. See, some things are not necessarily wrong. They're just not necessary. The good is often the enemy of the best. You can be a Christian and do a lot of things, yet never actually engage with God's will for your life. I'm a huge fan of C.S. Lewis. That's why the book that was given to me on the occasion of my induction was so pertinent. C.S. Lewis wrote a fantastic little book, The Screwtape Letters. And the two little devils are talking to each other. You read it, get hold of a copy, it's brilliant. And one of them says, the uncle says to the nephew, we can leave these Christians to it. We don't need to do very much. They make a bad enough job of things the way they are. Hmm. We get into all sorts of things, yet miss out on what God wants for us. David served God wholeheartedly. He was sacrificial as well. How can we claim to be Christians if it doesn't cost us? What are we doing with our lives? Is it just me, 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 me? Or actually, is it about serving God, serving one another? I wish we had more time to look at that, but we haven't. But I just wonder if you evaluate yourself there. Where do you stand in serving God? Do you do it grudgingly? Do you do it half-heartedly? Or do you do it gratefully? See, David was a man after God's own heart because when he sinned, he repented quickly. When he was under stress, he turned to God and trusted him immediately. When he served, he trusted him wholeheartedly, freely, willingly, and sacrificially. And then the fourth And final thing happened. Success. And David's response to success is fascinating. And counter-cultural to the day and age in which we live. Listen to this. I believe God wants you and I to be successful. Jeremiah 29 verse 11 it says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a future and to give you hope. I want us to hold on to that. God wants to use us and he wants to take our lives and he wants to build character in us 
so that we will do well at this thing called life. In 1 Samuel 18, it says, In everything David did, he had great success because the Lord was with him. He was, quite probably, one of the most successful men who's ever lived. After he knocked off Goliath, he became a national hero. His name was known everywhere. People wrote songs about him. You know that well-known one that made the, made the top 40? Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. That wasn't a tune. I just made it up, but you can have that one. <laughs> they loved this guy. You know? X Factor's got nothing. These, the, the, this guy would have been trotted out on TV AM. He'd have been running over to be on the Jeremy Kyle show. He'd have been going on to BBC Breakfast. He would have been on James Martin Saturday Kitchen. That's a great program, isn't it? Um, <laughs> well, nonsense again. This guy was a hero. Everybody loved him. Everywhere he went, they would have wanted his autograph. Everybody, if they'd had cameras, they'd have, the paparazzi would have been out. He could do no wrong. An unbroken string of success. He's famous. He's at the top of his career. That's where the test of the heart comes in. When things are going well. When you're at the top of your game. And what was his response? See, how do you handle success? How do you handle praise? How do you handle uh, when you get material success, financial reward? How do you handle the good life? How do you handle achievement? David's response was to give it all to God. He refused to take credit for it himself. He didn't let it get, get, get to his head. I remember reading many years ago, someone said, man is an amazing animal. He's the only animal, if you pat him on the back, his head swells. Hmm. Very few people can handle adulation and praise. Very few people can handle success without it in some way compromising them. So how do you handle praise? When everything is going great, it's so easy To forget God then, isn't it? Or don't tell me I'm the only one who struggles with that. When life's good, the discipline of the quiet time, the desire to be with God's people, to come to church, to keep on serving in that ministry that you've been doing for donkey's years. When life's good, very often, those are the things that start to wane. Yet David turns around and he says in Psalm 115, Not to us, O Lord. Not to us, but to your name be the glory. He didn't let it get to his head. When everything was praising him, he was saying, God, you get it. You get the credit for this. He had a very, very humble heart. How? How did that happen? Because he knew the truth. He knew the truth about himself. That he mucked up. He didn't get things right. It's amazing to me that these four qualities are the very qualities that most people overlook when they're looking for a successful person. When you go for a job interview, they usually don't look for you, for you to have humility or a servant heart or a repentant heart. The very qualities that most people overlook in others when they're looking for greatness are actually, however, the exact qualities God looks for. So I honestly believe that sat here this morning are great people. People with the potential for greatness. Because God is looking at our hearts this morning. You may not have the looks. You may not have the success. You may not have huge amounts of money. But if God did an x-ray on your heart, what would it reveal? Would it reveal that you're trusting Him? Or that you're anxious? When it comes to service, would it reveal a servant heart or a selfish heart? When things are going great, do you say, Lord, it's all from you and I'm grateful and I'm humbled by it? Or do you believe the press releases about yourself? God's not called us to be mediocre. He wants us to be better than average. He wants us to succeed at this thing. And he's with us. So what's the hang-up? What's 
preventing us this morning from becoming great women of God, great men of God? What's keeping us from that? Is it guilt? You're sitting there this morning thinking, if you only knew my past, Mark. The antidote to that is a repentant heart. Don't leave here this morning without sorting that one out. What's keeping you from greatness? What's keeping you from it? Is it service? Is it that you actually turn around and say, well, no, let somebody else do it. I'm too busy having my own fun, doing my own thing, running my own pleasure trip through life. You're bored. Give your life away in service. Volunteer to do something. Is everything going great in your life? Well, good. But be grateful and be humble. And I can start here this morning with a commitment. A commitment to God. And I'm going to invite us all now to bow our heads as we think seriously about this commitment to the Lord. Some of you are on the edge of spiritual greatness. I believe God sees our hearts right now. Maybe you think that God has called you to be an average, ordinary Christian. No, he hasn't. God is looking for people to use. He wants your life to count for something. Is this morning that time when you're going to say to God, I'm sorry. I know that you welcome me despite my faults and my failings. Forgive me. Are you sensitive? Do you have a tender conscience before the Lord? Is God challenging you to serve Him in some way? Is your life full of stress? Are you worrying about things? Then He welcomes you and says, I will walk with you. I will be with you. I will help you. Thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you for the example of men like David. We thank you that they were guys like us, full of failings, full of wrongs. But in your grace, you used them. And we pray that you will use us. So, Father, I ask in the name of Jesus that you would do a work in all of our hearts to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.